And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a very bug-filled episode of the Monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I've a returning good brother to the temple. Coming to us straight from Mistwood Publishing, the ma the mastermind behind the behind the Fostra saga, and uh, and now with a new, now with an upcoming novella known as Emerald Knights, the ones who do not kneel. The one and only S. R. Mori. How you doing today, man? I'm great, and I'm really impressed that you actually pronounced my name correctly. So that's awesome. I've um. I've had experience. <laughs> <laughs> so, to now, for, first off, um, I want to get I want to give my props for how for how well um the how well the Veil of Stars um turn um was able to was able to come out successfully, um and thank you for putting up mm -hmm. with the um with the address bullshit on my on my end because, um, Indiegogo decided to use my old address when it came to that whole thing. Yeah, I've had with a few campaigns I backed. You know, I recently moved, and I had kind of the same issue. So, so I'm like really understanding for things like that because it kind of happened to me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, I'd I'd like to I'd like to start I'd like to start at the origin story of a sword. Now, I already. We already did the origin story when it came to you as a writer the last time I had you on, but mm -hmm. for this, I'd like I'd like to delve into the origin story of of um of Emerald of Emerald Knights as a concept. Was this something that was kind was kind of was kind of in the back bur in the back burner and just had just had to be queued up, or did does its origins tie a bit more recent? Yeah, its origins are really recent. Um, this the story wasn't even an idea six months ago. Um, so, you know, I I was thinking about doing a comic book and looking into that because, you know, I'm a part of you know the comic skate community. You know, at least in a casual sense. So it's. I was kind of like looking and seeing what they were interested into and you know it's called comics you know gate so I was thinking about a comic book and so I was kind of looking at can I write one of those like do I even know how to write one of those would I be good at it and I was looking at costs with artists and things and I was just kind of like weighing the pros and cons and I was like you know what it's looking to be like it would probably cost a lot of money to do a very small amount of story. And so I thought, well, maybe that maybe there's a way to do a visual medium that is that I can still tell more story with. And so then I remembered uh, some of the books that the Tolkien estate puts out um, that came, you know, have come together after you know, Tolkien's death, they have these pencil drawings in them amid the story. So I was like, well, I always really liked those. I always felt like it really added to the aesthetic of the story, uh, especially like the Children of Hearn and such. So I was like, I wonder if I could find an artist that might be able to do something similar to that. And I came, a, kind of accidentally came across an artist on Instagram named Mark Soko, I might be mispronouncing his last name, but it's S O O C O. And he kind of had that style. And so I was like, okay, well, I think the strength of a comic book is it's a visual medium. And the strength of prose is that you can tell more story in less amount of paper space. And you can be very, you can be very artistic with how you word things. It can be very poetic and very beautiful. So I thought, what if I combined the strengths of these two mediums into one. And so it's not like a super long story. It's like 35 
Microsoft Word pages. Um, and there's, well, I think, around like 20 pieces of art that are going in it. So I kind of looked at, you know, what part of the comic book art is usually the most loved and what isn't. And so I was kind of thinking through that and I kind of realized, well, the dialogue parts are, I think, usually where comic books might struggle the most because you're trying to fit, you know, dialogue in these little word bubbles. And, you know, if the dialogue's too long, then it takes like you don't want to have too many pages of dialogue unless you're Frank Miller. Um, so I was like, well, so let's do artwork in the spots that people like in comic books, like when a new character shows up and they have this cool design. That's usually, you know, where they have their big splash pages or an epic combat scene. You know, that's usually where comic book artists really pour their attention to detail, you know, aside from covers. And so Emerald Knights has story and prose writing, which allows the dialogue to breathe and feel more realistic and natural. It's not limited with a air bubble, but you still have that epic amazing art that really enhances the story and um, for how short of a story it is it really is quite a bit of art um, to fit in the such a short amount of pages uh, there really is a work of a very detailed work of art on almost every page so it's I think I struck a really nice medium and if I toot on my own, own horn a little bit it's some of the best writing I've ever done because uh, it was more of like quality over quantity i kind of embrace the artistic writing methods so it just sounds it has a nice flow to it mm -hmm. it sounds really good when you read it out loud so that was kind of the process of the idea it came about really quick and then once i had the idea you know initially i was like oh i'll wait a while to write it but the passion was like just burning in me like i wanted to write it so i ended up just taking a break from the book I'm writing right now and just wrote Emerald Knights in like seven days. Um, and here we are. Yeah. Now that, now um, that brings me, that brings me to a few things. Obviously, obviously something like, obviously something like this, we, there, there's the fact, there's the fact that we, ha that you're doing, you, you've, esp you've especially, you started up the whole um, the whole emerald label, which I believe you had mentioned it had mentioned in the past was a label specifically for significantly darker stories than your than mm -hmm. um, your other works. Um, what putting us putting aside page count, mm -hmm. what would you say? Are, what would you say are some of the primary differences in sto in storytelling methods between uh, between um the veil vale of stars for instance your previous work which was a full, which right. was a full on novel and mm -hmm. emerald knights so yeah other than the page length and there being artwork inside of the book aside from a map um the tone is is darker and 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 I, and I want to say that the veil vale of stars is still really really dark at some points but there's also a lot of hope. I know we talked last time of me trying to hit that balance between high fantasy and dark fantasy and optimism and nihilism. This book leans a little bit, oh, a lot bit more towards the nihilism. And it's usually when I write a novel, it it's like I'm trying to obey the rules of writing that are established by just kind of, what's accepted for writing a novel. But in Emerald Knights, I kind of just really embrace the stylized approach. So it's much more poetic and uh, almost like you're, I don't want to say like you're reading Macbeth or like Shakespeare because it doesn't, at all, it doesn't sound like that at all. But it does kind of have that epic vibe to it of like, the way things are worded are just a little bit different than what would be accepted in a standard novel. Like certain words might be left out of a sentence to make it feel more ambiguous. 
uh, there might be like a poem show up that helps the narrative. It's kind of just like a very stylized form of writing. I kind of already have a natural way of making things sound a little bit more medieval, Mm -hmm. but my editors, my editors kind of usually weed that out to make it appeal more to general audiences, if you will. But with Emerald Knights, it kind of just let my natural creativity really flow. And I think it like weirdly, you'd think that that would be bad, but I think it really paid off. I think it, especially the first chapter is actually my favorite. It just sounds really, really beautiful in a really dark and bloody and gritty way. It's like you didn't know that violence could be written so beautifully sort of a thing, but it's, it's very, um, it's very black, gray, green, kind of gritty, uh, really embracing that kind of like the vibe that you would get and watching. I don't know if you've seen the Amazon Prime's Macbeth with Michael Fassbender, but it, it definitely kind of has that vibe to it of just being really kind of dark, gritty, and almost kind of like a tragedy. Not just, you know, if you're looking at just this issue of Emerald Knights, you might not necessarily get the tragedy vibe, but when the whole story is said and done, it's going to have a very Arthurian slash Macbeth tragedy kind of uh, vibe to it. Which is in- is interesting because when you had first des- when you had first described the differences um, between Emerald Knights and Veil of Stars, um, I had ha- I was half jokingly remarking in my head that. Veil of, that Veil of Stars would be more, would would be more German literature, whereas um, Emerald Knights is more Russian literature. Hmm. <laughs> um, obvious, obviously, that's obviously that's um, a significant exaggeration, to say the least. But what I am cur- what I am curious about is what you descri- what you describe as medieval writing. Um, it would be very easy to assume that that, me- that that means a lot of a, a lot of attempts at o- at old English, but mm-hmm. what? But I'd like you to I'd like you to go into what ex- is what exactly medieval style writing means to you. So I tend to avoid using words like, you know, sounding like an Arthurian legend, like "I'll smite thee down, horse and man." By the faith of my body, our Lord Jesus Christ, and all that. I, I don't necessarily go too heavy on it because I know that can be confusing, but it's almost like you're looking at the way that sentences are structured. Um, like you kind of almost see it in the way lines are delivered in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. Sometimes they kind of just talk like the way they're structuring their sentences Mm -hmm. a little bit more um, poetic in the way they talk. And it kind of gives it kind of like a ye olde uh, vibe to it. Like um, I could probably find a good sentence from Emerald Knights. Um that's the pressure on, but you know why not? Um, <laughs> based on how you're describing, would you say would you say that it's leaning a little bit more towards prose? Yeah, I mean it's definitely prose writing, but it's like it's really hard to define. But it's um, it's it's almost it just has a very unique feel to it, and then that it's very. I don't know, like stylized in that it's it's just very it almost feels like you're reading a poem in prose format, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um I I hesit I hesitate to use I hesitate to use the word epic because it's been ridiculously butchered over 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 the last thirty or so years. Um but that it but that is Definitely, some definitely something that come that comes to mind, um, and I'd say I'd say it's 
would would be fair to say it's one it's one of those things where when you're when you're writing in that style, you have to be constantly on point. Yeah, that's how I would describe it. Is it's especially in the first chapter. I feel like every line is on point. Mm -hmm. Now, you um in the in the Indiegogo um preview page, you had you you cited a few and you cited a few interesting um references when it comes to, when it comes to the style. Um, yeah, that being because and I find this to be an interesting combination. Um, Shakespearean tragedy. You already mentioned Macbeth, so we've got so we've got that down pat. Um, La Mort de Arthur, i.e. I, the um, the version of King Arthur that we all re that we all read as kids. Mm -hmm. um, Lord of the Rings, Skyrim, and eighties action movies like Rambo. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, I I don't want I don't want I. I don't want to come off like a dick, but I keep but I read that and I keep thinking one of these things is not like the other things. So how do you balance between those two? And I'm a, especially since I'm a, when you bring up Rambo, I'm assuming you're you're referring to First Blood. So yeah, dealing, you know, with like Macbeth, which is my favorite Shakespearean play, it's really kind of what inspired the tone of it. I was rereading Macbeth and I was like, man, I really like this. I really, you know, it really is a, a very dark and, you know, it is a tragedy. It, it definitely lives up to that. So I wanted to kind of convey that. And that's kind of, so Macbeth kind of sets the tone of, of inspiration and La Morte de Arthur kind of sets like these are knights. There's a code of nobility. Um, the main character will probably in later issues remind people of King Arthur and Sir Gawain probably a little bit. And um, Lord of the Rings, obviously, because all modern fantasy is inspired from Lord of the Rings in some way. Um, Skyrim, be I give Skyrim credit because it's really kind of what inspired my idea that orcs aren't villains in my series. They're more like misunderstood heroes or anti-heroes, heroes with a tendency to be incredibly violent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then how can I bring that and relate it to kind of Rambo? And that kind of ties in really the cause of the, that I'm trying to accomplish. So all of the prophets of Emerald Knights will be going to Mission 22 to help vets who are struggling with PTSD and other such things. And so if you remember in First Blood, at the very end, you know, Rambo gives that spiel, and you can, you know, breaking down and crying, and you kind of see that movie, and even in the Rambo First Blood Part 2, he has a speech, you know, uh, the general asks him, you know, what do you want? He's like, I want the same thing that all these guys wanted. I want the country that you know, they bled and died for to love them as much as they love it. And so kind of like that respect towards military personnel, as well as Rambo is a total badass. And, you know, he's like the ultimate warrior and the Emerald Knights kind of have that vibe too. So it's like, it's like Rambo in that it's very respectful of things that, military personnel um, struggle with, go through in the midst of battle, as well as, you know, my characters, a lot of them are orcs. So there is that kind of like vets coming back from Vietnam, you know, they were kind of misunderstood and treated badly. The orcs in my world are misunderstood and treated badly. So it's not necessarily that the tone is set by the 80s movies. It's more of you have these guys that are absolute total masculine personified being badass, but also, you know, like John Rambo, you know, they have that, that deeper side to them and they might not say it in front of each other all the time, but with prose writing, you can kind of get inside their head and 
hear what they're thinking and and so it's it's inspired by 80s action movies specifically rambo in that there was this you know badass soldier that you know is just like really a really good fighter and he's really impressive and he's epic and he's like the personification of everything masculine like uh yorin mm-hmm. he's the main character he you know he's always got a stogie I, you know it's fantasy so it's like you can really do whatever you want like but he has a stogie just like arnold schwarzenegger does in so many of his you know action flicks and you know he just he has all these gadgets and he's an orc that has like a chest rig even though guns don't exist in my books he has components to make his crossbow bolts which can explode and make green fire so he's kind of like that commando arnold schwarzenegger john rambo he's ready for any situation he's like an expert assassin he's just a total badass but he also has that you know i've you know to survive war you got to become war kind of like mm-hmm. mentality to him and so that's how it's derived from 80s action flicks is just kind of it's a very hyper masculine story there are females in it but it's it's mainly um just really pretty masculine centered now given that given that um i'm cu- i'm curious i'm curious if um if a film like predator could also be a bit of a frame of reference when it comes to when, mm-hmm. when it comes to the discussion of eight of eighties films. Um, yeah, it's just, certainly it's, anything with anything with Arnold being just a complete badass would certainly yeah. have that comparison. It's just that um something like something like Predator is taking the whole the whole badass hero and fl- and flipping it on its head because. You've got a bunch of people who are supposed to be these badasses among badasses who are completely out, are completely outclassed by the um by by the tit by the titular predator until 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 you have Arnold essentially playing the game playing the game his way um and in the in in that same Although I'd say, although when it comes to that whole reversing it, I I would I'm tempted to bring up Aliens, but Aliens is more of a more of a more of a sla, more of a slasher when it comes to that particular concept. Um. So get, but that brings me to another thing. So you have you have this very hyper masculine setup, in juxtaposed with juxtaposed um with a gr- just well. Just opposed with a Greek tragedy, um, and or rather, or rather, I don't know why I end up saying Greek tragedy. That's a bad habit of mine. But what I'm cur- what I'm curious into that is how is how is how you ma- is how you maintain the um, the tra- the tragic at the tragedy aspect in what is ultimately a power fantasy. Of a of a character archetype. Not, you know, I don't want to spoil too much. You know, it's not in this issue that the downfall would take place. But the overarching story um, is a tragedy. And that, and and you read La Morte de Arthur, and it's also a tragedy. It doesn't end very happy. It's not necessarily a Shakespearean tragedy, but it is a tragedy. Um, I'm pretty sure it's, I don't know if it's officially considered a tragedy, but I've heard people describe it as a tragedy. Um, I think the audio book I listened to said the tragedy of King Arthur. I don't. I don't remember. I heard that from somewhere. It's certainly. It's. Um. I'm not. I can't say whether it. it whether it is or isn't. I'm. I will say that there's enough evidence to go. It to go. To go in that direction. But for for me, one of the. It's interesting to bring that up because obviously the key, obviously the key arc with um. 
with with Lamorta Arthur is the ch is the chosen boy king accepting his destiny, rising up to glory, and then being un and then being undone by his own by his own actions. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. If you look at the bullet points version of say Beowulf, um, depending depending on translation, because you know how you know how it is with classical literature. <laughs> um, yes. And in th in that same regard, do you now? I'm not. I'm, I'm not asking for spoilers, but is mm -hmm. that is that kind of rise rise and fall um, set of bullet points something that you something that you've cons something that you've considered with um, Emerald Knights? Yeah, I have the whole um, plot lined out. Now, one thing that's different is, and I mean, it's a small spoiler, but someone that's really paying attention would be able to figure it out right away mm -hmm. um, as far as like page like three. Yorin like his downfall doesn't necessarily result in his physical death but more of like a status and heart downfall if you will like he's more like emotionally a loss more of faith. like an emotional yeah like he kind of gets broken down and he loses his standing and prowess and you know reputation mm -hmm. so like eventually like the emerald knight series is kind of showing you where yorin has been and eventually yorin actually will be pulled into the same story as the veil of stars arc just quite a bit down the road Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of merging those two together in order to get Yorin where he has to be by when he enters the main storyline is he needs to be broken down and kind of put into, you know, have that downfall. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so like the book I'm writing right now, you know, on the side, you know, while I'm working em on Emerald Knights, he is in that book. It's just he's, you know, later in life. Um, and, you know, if you look at the artwork that I have, like, that's like the cover, he has an eye patch. Mm -hmm. Well, when you read Emerald Knights, you're going to figure out he doesn't have an eye patch. And so that, and I, again, I don't want to spoil, but there's stuff in the first few pages where anybody with half a brain will be able to figure out. You know, eye patch here, eye patch there. Oh my, this is Yorin. You know, obviously at some point his eye is going to get cut out. It's not necessarily in this issue, but at some point in his life, that's going to happen. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting thing to work with. A lot of trying, having to be organized and not mixing things up. Now. The uh, this might be this might be a bit me of me over re, over reading into names, but mm -hmm. um, I I want to I want to focus a bit on the knight part of of Emerald Knights. Now, especially since you mentioned um, Lamorta Arthur, one of which is the which is the monolith of um of that of that era of romanticism. Um, mm -hmm. You have you have the t you have the titular idea of the knight striving for chivalric chivalric ideals and and villainous and the act of vil villainy among knights being those who do not aspire or aspire against those those kind of ideals. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the whereas um Yorin, um the the um the power fantasy that you have him, that you have him going through um in when you stack that up against the romantic image of the of the knight would see would seem abhorrent to the, to the more to the more chivalrous types um mm -hmm. is is that something you and is that something you intend to br to bring up in the story how he's about him being a knight who's acting in a very unchivalrous fashion Yes, so yeah, that's that for me. That's one of the things that makes the story especially interesting, 
is that you have this concept of a knight and you have this concept of an orc, right? Mm -hmm. Both of which you're coming at with prior feelings, right? Like you, you think of an orc from Lord of the Rings. Well, very quickly, you're going to realize that these orcs are different like they were in Veil of Stars, but you know, the Emerald Knights, you don't have to have read the Veil of Stars to get the Emerald Knights. So like, what would an orc knight look like, you know? And, and so how is that different? So like, Yorin is more akin to an orc knight in general, much less Yorin himself, is more akin to maybe like Sir Gawain in the Arthurian legend, in that Sir Gawain is always, you know, cutting heads off first and asking questions later. He's very rash. He's very almost like bloodthirsty. He makes a lot of mistakes and he kind of gets, you know, reprimanded for those. You know, there's that time he, the guy's asking for mercy and Gawain is, you know, in the heat of his passion. He goes to cut off the guy's head. Well, the guy's wife jumps in the way and Gawain cuts her head off. And so King Arthur makes Gawain wear that woman's head around his neck for like, you know, a few weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So orc knights are kind of in that same mentality of Gawain, right? So the Arthurian knight, even in the medieval age, people would have read that story and understood that knights aren't actually like King Arthur and Sir Lancelot and especially Sir Galahad and Sir Percival. But it was kind of like how we see Superman, right? He's an ideal to strive toward, not that anybody's actually like him. And so in that similar fashion, you know, it's kind of like Sir Gawain where he wants to be that chivalrous knight, but his emotions get the best of him. And so that's kind of what my orc knights are like. You know, they they're striving to be that standard of knighthood, but they're orcs. And so they have a tendency to be brutal and their anger gets the best of them. Another bit of it is Yorin refuses to kneel. And so everybody under his command, they don't kneel. I mean, that's part of the marketing thing. We don't kneel. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of comes into the history of orcs in the world that I've built of they've been mistreated a lot. They've been tricked a lot by kings and such. So part of, like, Yorin's technically a knighted soldier, but he also refuses to join the king of his country's official army and official knighthood because in order to do that, he would have to kneel. So it's a very interesting dichotomy of that brutish warrior and that chivalrous knight kind of thing but um kind of something with chivalry you know i'm a history teacher uh with the medieval ages chivalry actually really only existed between two knights that believed that they were on equal social standing mm -hmm. and it was kind of like an agreement that i'm not going to kill you or fight dirty unless i have to and so the goal was you fought respectfully with the knights that you perceived to be equal to you. And if you can get them to, for lack of a better word, say uncle, you know, subdue them, you can, instead of killing them, hold them for ransom. And so they can hang out at your, you know, your estate or your castle or whatever in kind of like a, not prison necessarily, unless it's a really untrustworthy, um, adversary but more of like under like house arrest if you will until their family can pay the ransom mm -hmm. or their lord can pay the ransom so like our modern understanding of chivalry and the medieval understanding of chivalry is a little bit different but again that arthurian legend was written back then and so there was that ideal to strive towards that chivalry kind of uh embodies there so chivalry in and of itself is a really interesting thing to kind of play around with too um it's interesting that you, it's interesting that you bring up the Green Knight, given, um, and I'm not I'm not just saying that because of the recent film that came out, which I still mm -hmm. haven't seen, but also the also the role that also the role that the Green Knight um, ta takes place, uh, that he has, 
especially especially in the in the um poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight um of him, of him be of him being essentially a essentially a judge a, a judge of knights who can certainly be can certainly be nice but still scares people um was was the was the portrayal of the green knight one of the um stronger influences on you when writing It doesn't really respect it doesn't respect Gawain at all, but I could talk about that for a long time. Um, but the Green Knight, um, he might not necessarily influence this story, but the Green Knight, I have my own version of him in the broader story that he will show up in that testing of knighthood and such and i'm very much so looking forward to it he even will show up in the emerald knights series itself just because i i mean i really love that poem i read it almost every year um and the green knight is i just i love how he you know you find out at the end the green knight was sir bartolak and like he's been testing gawain's honor to make him a better knight this whole time I just think I just love him as a character. Hey, one thing about the movie is the design of the Green Knight in the movie. I think is just really cool and really beautiful and uh, really interesting. So yes, the Green Knight is an inspiration, not necessarily on this chapter of Emerald Knights, but certainly in issues to come, he will be. Mm -hmm. And. When it comes now, when it comes to the when it comes to the um, this being a this being a very a very darker take on um, writing, um, I found I found that when when people try and when a lot of times when people try and do darker takes on on fiction, it's a very it's a very careful balance to make sure that the dark that the darkness doesn't descend into full on kitsch. The problem, the problem that can happen with say, with say, um, with say stuff like Warhammer or Vampire to use some RPG um, ver versions, or even even the supposed dark darkness is supposed to be in um, something like Game of Thrones, something like Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you ma how do you maintain that that sense of darkness without it without it becoming too comical? Yeah, I, I totally get that. I think that a lot of people kind of fail at that, especially in like kind of like cheap TV shows. I think they often suffer from that. And I'm not going to say that I'm immune to that, but usually if I ever do take it too far, like the first draft of The Veil of Stars, I think kind of took it in that direction. Usually editors are able to be like, hey, this is kind of like gotten to the point where it's so much that it's cheesy um because like when you're writing a story a lot of times you're just you kind of get in your own head and sometimes you don't necessarily see things that the general audience would because you just you know it's like you don't necessarily see the imperfections in your own child sort of thing mm -hmm. and so editors have been very very helpful in that regard because I am somebody that sometimes I'm not necessarily certain if I'm getting the point across, so I'll take it too far. And so editors have really been able to rail me in and be like, okay, it's, it's, you're coming on a little too strong. And thankfully with Emerald Knights, my one editor, who's usually very blunt with those sort of things. Um, she was like, okay, this is very dark and it is very gritty and kind of depressing, but it's done in a tasteful way and it's not overdone. Um, so I mean, she's because it kind of has that Macbeth inspiration and the kind of like the 
tempo kind of feeling of it too when you're reading it that artistic feel it kind of makes it to where you can't necessarily as easily dive into that kitsch kind of almost like some of those later friday the 13th movies kind of thing uh where it's just kind of ridiculous and not scary at all or it kind of loses its impact because it gets too gory and silly right Mm -hmm. so there is like one scene in particular where i think i really just did a fantastic job of um articulating that it's creepy it's dark and it's sad but it's not too much and i'm very very proud of it i'm very proud of this story in general and that brings me to what to one other um one other archetype that was pi- that was popularized for lack of a better word within within Le Morte Arthur and has been and has been used as a kind of stock char- as a as a kind of stock character for ye- for years and that is the concept of the black knight um mm-hmm. is I'm not now. I'm not now. Um. Obviously, the obviously the approach of it is is usually something that leans on the villainous end of things. But is 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 that particular archetype represented in Emerald Knights in some in some form? Um. No. Um. It really, really, the main character is Yorin. I kind of take the story to just really flesh him out. Like he's really the focus of the whole story. There are there are other characters that will get more defined in even the next one, Emerald Knights Two. Um, you know, Yorin being established, he's still a main character in the next one. But I do kind of spend more time on the other characters in the next one than I have planned. Mm-hmm. Um. But I don't have any plans for a Black Knight necessarily, um, but at least not in not in this in the Emerald Knight story. I do kind of have like a Sir Lancelot and Guinevere sort of thing planned. Um, definitely different. It's not the same as the Arthurian legend, but it is like you could say. Not necessarily allegorical, but there are character. There is a character that's inspired by Guinevere. There is a character that's inspired by Lancelot. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily classify any of the characters as that archetypal Black Knight, which, at least not yet. Which um, I should I should clarify that there's um, there's really there's really been two primary takes when it comes to the when it comes to the idea of the Black Knight um, archetype. Um, the the one is the most popular, of course, is is the one is the villainous knight associated with darkness that opposes mm-hmm. that opposes the knight errant. Um, the but and but as time went on, a different interpretation began to manifest. That being a a um a knight who would paint his armor black to disguise any sort of livery, so people so he would become. A more anonymous type of type of knight, mm-hmm. um, which also pr- which also prompted the story that um, that some that um some some knights would would um paint their armor black so it was so it didn't require as much maintenance which isn't a hundred it isn't a hundred percent true, but it it kind of, in some some people reinterpreted the idea of the black knight into kind kind of a um kind of a european equivalent to the to the masterless ronin um mm. and uh, that that and um given given that um would either would either of those i know you mentioned having plans for the for the black for the black knight but would eat would the alternative interpretation play a fa- play a factor in the in the present or fu- or future plans with emerald knights
So there is a character that will have black armor. His name's Uvial Ebenskin. But he doesn't fit that archetypal, like, I'm the foil to the errant knight. But in terms of this other type of black knight that you've brought about, which, interestingly enough, Sir Lancelot does kind of disguise himself a few times, not necessarily in black armor, but to, you know, be like, well, I'm so popular, I need to hide myself so people don't target me. I would say Yorin kind of almost has that in a way because again you know he's he doesn't want to submit to the king of the land right so he kind of has like his own he hates being called mercenary but i mean really we're looking at the definition of mercenary he kind of is one even though he hates it you know being called one um so in a way yorin is that black knight if you will that doesn't really want to be beholden to a master and so he's kind of like a almost like a freelancer knight when when you say that he's when you say that he's that he doesn't want to be holden to a master is he is he someone who would be more a lot of times with characters who are who have that kind of approach um folk have a bigger emphasis on on being beholden to a certain ideal moral code or or something akin to that you know the difference between external and internal honor mm -hmm. would he yeah would he, he fall into that yeah he does so a lot of the orcs in my books they're very loyal to the what i would call the ancient religion which would be maybe what we would consider like judaism and so his moral code is very um uh hold latched on to that so like as per the ancient religion says the orcs were made after all of the other races and the god figure if you will yahweh figure if you will he made the orcs intentionally brutal and intentionally really good at war and fighting because he made them with the specific purpose of being his, you know, the defenders of the other races in the world. And so they, orcs tend to be very, a hold, like they're brutal because that's what they were designed to do, but they only are really like that to bad people, you know, kind of like the Punisher. Mm -hmm. He's very brutal, but he only hurts bad people. And so that's kind of like the orc, um, they're very brutal. They were made to be brutal on purpose, um, but they only hurt maybe who they perceive to be bad. And so they follow that ancient religion. And so Yoren's moral compass and his master, the one person he would kneel to, would be obviously the Yahweh figure. So he does kind of get his moral fiber from the Yahweh um, deity, kind of like Judaism. Um, and gi given that, that brings me to some something else in terms of um how how other people perceive him. It do because a lot of t a lot of times when you have somebody who has that leaning towards brutality, people um, look at them as if they're a powder keg that'll go off at any moment, even though that's not always true. Um, mm -hmm. is he is he viewed by is he viewed by other other knights, so, soldiers, merc mercenaries, or even peasants in that same manner? So he... I would draw the comparison to one of the other big inspirations to the character himself, and that is Napoleon Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. Right? So his enemies feared him a great deal. But when it came to his own men... Napoleon just had a way of really connecting with them. And so people people of the town, the city that he lives in, they really kind of see him as a protector that you don't want to get on the bad side of. because. Mm -hmm. But he's not going to hurt you unless he perceives you to be a, a villain, right? Like someone who's 
who we would probably classify as, you know, a bad person, like a child molester or, or a murderer or something like that. Um, but so like Napoleon Bonaparte, he would, you know, he wasn't that general that, which was weird, you know, given the time period generals didn't do this. He was up on the front lines with them. You know, he'd come out of the battle covered in dirt and blood. Uh, he would put himself at risk a lot. He would take war medals off of his own jacket that he had earned and give them to his soldiers. He was very considerate of his men. He respected them. They respected him. And that's kind of where Yoren falls, you know, later in the book I'm writing now. You know, some of the other characters are celebrating the battle, you know, like the generals, the high ups. They're all celebrating the battle, and Yorin is technically a high up, but he doesn't really feel at home among them, so he leaves and goes and hangs out with, you know, the common soldier instead. That's kind of Yorin in that way. He has a very tender heart towards the people under his command. And I, I can, um, I can, I can certainly, I can certainly see that. And given now, given the, given that kind, given that kind of, set, given that kind of setup, would that, would that tie into why he, why he does not like being called a mercenary? Because even, even if he doesn't march, even if he doesn't march to the beat of most, he still considers himself a person of authority. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he does have like Napoleon. He does have an ego. He does think that he he knows that he's a badass. You know what I mean? Um, you know, like Rambo. You know, he knows he's a badass. Arnold Schwarzenegger characters they know they're badasses. Napoleon, you know, and that pride, at least in Napoleon's case, end up in his downfall. But um, yeah, Yoren definitely he has an aura of confidence about him most certainly. And I think that people tend to flock to confidence and that's probably a bit of his draw. But so like, yeah, he doesn't like being called a mercenary because to him, he's like, well, the only reason I'm not a part of your military officially is because you won't, not, you know, make me it unless I kneel, you want me to submit to you. And that's not what I'm about. It's like, if you, make it to where I can join and not have to kneel, submit, then I'll join your military. But I'm not going to kneel, you know, no matter what. So he considers himself an honorable, an honorable person, but he's not, you know, he's, he's not going to kneel, you know, I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now with that, with that in mind, what would you, what are you um what are you shoot what are you shooting for as far as as far as the um release t release timeline since right now right now it's just in the pre-launch phase on Indiegogo right so like with the veil of stars i personally don't like to start a campaign until the book is done so something i'm very proud of with the veil of stars is that Compared to other campaigns, I got it out relatively quickly. Um, there are s some campaigns I backed two years ago that I s still don't have. Um, so I have about half of the artwork done now. And so I'm hoping that by very early September we'll launch. And I think by early October the artwork will be done. And so by the time the campaign ends, um, probably early November, you know, depending on how long I decide to have the campaign go, it will all be done. I, it'll take me a bit of time to assemble it, given the software I'm going to be using to make the book. Um, so by the time the artwork is done and then I assemble it all, I'll be able to ship everything out you know, probably the week of the campaign ending. And that's the way I like to do it. Um, so hopefully the campaign, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't, 
will launch within the first week of September, go for, you know, however long I decide, and then I will get the books out before Christmas, maybe even before Thanksgiving. All right, I get, I, I can get, beh I can get behind that. But with all of that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for being willing to come, to come back up to the temple and, indul and indulge in the, ed indulge in the adventures and misadventures that happened all the way up here. <laughs> and anytime, hey, it's my pleasure. Yep. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Drink, and as we always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I would be glad to be back at any time. And of course, you're a very good host. And of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>